What makes a great leader great? How do we create a high-performing team? And when we say leader, we mean everyone, because everyone is leading their own life. Will yours be a life by design or a life by default? Those are the big questions, and this podcast will answer them. Welcome to the Becoming Your Best podcast, where we help you apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders, because great leaders will produce great results. Welcome to our Becoming Your Best podcast listeners, wherever you might be in the world today. This is your host, Steve Schallenberger. We are delighted to have you with us. And also our special guest today, Andrew Tarvin. He is the world's first humor engineer, (laughs) teaching people how to get better results while having fun. Welcome, Drew. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you bet. I've been looking forward to this. And before we get started today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Drew. Combining his background as a project manager at Procter & Gamble with his experience as a stand-up comedian, he reverse engineers the skill of humor in a way that is practical actionable, and gets results in the workplace. And through his company, Humor That Works, Drew has worked with more than 35,000 people at over 250 organizations, including Microsoft, the FBI. They need a little humor, don't they? Mm -hmm. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. And the International Association of Canine Professionals. All righty, that's a good group. Well, he (laughs) is a best-selling author has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Fast Company. And his TEDx talk has been viewed by more than 4 million individuals. He loves the color orange, is obsessed with chocolate, (laughs) and can solve a Rubik's Cube, but it does take like seven minutes. So let's just get going, Drew. Tell us about your background and and especially maybe any turning points or things that may have led you to be doing what you're doing today. What's your story? Yeah, and absolutely, because people are often surprised by hearing the, the term humor engineer. They're like, first of all, you made that up, and that's true, I did. Second of all, they're like, humor engineer, that seems like a little bit of an oxymoron, but it's very much kind of what I do, and, and that background comes from two places. And so I've always been an engineer. I've always had an engineering mindset. I've always been obsessed with efficiency, right? How do I do the least amount of work while getting the most amount of gain? So I went to The Ohio State University, got a degree in computer science and engineering. And after I graduated, I started working at Procter & Gamble as an IT project manager. I remember pretty early on at PNG, one of my first meetings I was in a meeting that was incredibly boring. You know, it was like kind of like you would rather watch the paint on a wall dry type boring. And the problem was that I was the one leading the meeting. I was like, all right, if I'm bored while talking, they have to be bored (laughs) while listening. And uh, so I decided to start to incorporate a little bit of some of the the things that I had started doing in college. And so in college, I had started doing improv and stand up. And what I started to realize was one at PNG, I realized that you can't be efficient with humans because humans have, you know, emotions and feelings and they have to like eat and drink and they get sick and tired and all those, you know, human things that they do. So instead of being efficient, you had to be effective. And as I started to incorporate more improv and stand up or things that I learned there, started to realize that that's what was helping me be effective with people. So I started to explore that intersection of humor in the workplace, improv in business, happiness and productivity, and realized that I was getting better results for it. Okay, good. And where did your desire or vision or idea come from to be an improv comedian? Well, I wish that I could say that, you know, I was sitting there one day and decided, oh, I could do it. But The reality is that my best friend in college wanted to start an improv comedy group. He needed people and forced me to join. Basically, what I didn't have in comedy skill, I made up for in comedy project management. I was like, all right, well, you guys are more of the funny ones, so I'll I'll manage some of this stuff and also perform. But I was the one that was like, all right, if we're going to do this, we should, you know, practice three times a week. We should have 
business meetings every Monday. We should, you know, tape all of our shows and go back and watch it to see if we can learn anything from it. That was my introduction into it was kind of someone pushing me into it because I never growing up, I was never the the person that was like, oh, I'm going to be on stage or I want to be on stage. It was more of kind of getting pushed into it and then discovering that I, I loved it and that, you know, I was bad when we first started, but over time I started to get better. It is amazing, Drew, how people can change our lives. It is. It truly is. I, I tell that uh, that friend all the time that in some ways he's ruined my life because I had kind of the career that I wanted to right out of graduating school with a job at PNG. And then it was because of that improv that it, it led me to, to want to do something else. And of course, I'm much better for it. But of course, I have to joke with him and say that he's he's completely altered that trajectory. Right. And are you still with PNG? I am not. No. So I left PNG seven years ago to to do this humor engineer thing full time. And here you are. And here I am. So yeah. how's, it, how's it going? It's going really well. So uh, every year, business wise, the, the business has grown. And this year in particular, I've, you know, led a number of events. I've been to, to some really cool places. I've, you know, in my career, I've spoken or performed in all 50 states and in 25 countries and one planet Earth so far. But we've worked with over 250 organizations all around the world on how to use humor. And so it, it's something that I'm, I'm really proud to be able to be doing. Well, good. Good for you. Congratulations. So excited to hear that, Drew. You know, one of my early mentors and a wonderful man by the name of Gardner Russell also believed in humor. And it was interesting how he used humor. And I might add, Drew, that just like your friend impacted your life, I think this podcast has a chance to impact all of the listeners that they can do better in uh, just across the board by incorporating some humor. And just like Gardner Russell, we would, I remember being in some very intense meetings and people were almost freezing up on some big high stakes issues. And Gardner would just throw out this joke and it was a good one. It would change, of course, but then everybody would laugh. And then when the laughter was over, he'd say, listen, we can do this. Let's put our heads together and figure out how to solve this problem. And, yeah, absolutely. And bang, all of a sudden we're off to the races. So I'm so glad that we're talking about it. It can have a very big impact on it. I love humor. I love to use it. But there's a right way and a wrong way. So let's talk about humor. How is humor a skill that really can be learned by anyone? Yeah, well, I would say that, you know, kind of to build what you're saying is, is, with this podcast, yeah, it can inspire people. And that's part of the reason why I'm so passionate about what it is that I do is that, you know, it's it's one thing to teach people comedy when they're interested in it, when they, you know, sign up for an improv class or take a stand up comedy workshop or that kind of thing. But the work that we do is often going into organizations where, you know, some of the employees didn't necessarily, they weren't the ones that hired us, but they're there to, to get better, improve their skills. And so, I feel fortunate that I can be kind of just like my friend was the one that kind of pushes or encourages people into into using humor. And along those lines, like you said, humor is absolutely a skill, which means it can be learned. You know, there's an art and a science to comedy, to humor. And, you know, we can teach the science piece. We can teach things like comedic structure, putting the funny part of a joke at the end, the importance of, you know, kind of pause or delivery. We can talk about kind of some of the different shortcuts or strategies of using humor. That's the science part of it. And then the art part of it is, you know, people having a chance to actually practice it, them developing their own sense of humor into something that's a little bit more interesting or into a way that other people understand it. And so what we say is, you know, we think that we can help make anyone funnier, you know, not necessarily across the board funny. You won't necessarily, you know, get a Netflix comedy special after some of the, the workshops or the book or whatever, but you should be at a place that you better now understand it. And so you know, that's what we, we focus on. What are these strategies that, that people can learn so that they can get better results? Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, you mm -hmm. talked about both the science and the art of humor. Can mm -hmm. you take a minute and talk about both the science and the art? Absolutely. So the science of it, I would say a couple of things are, are helpful to keep in mind around, particularly, you know, humor in the workplace is, is one is that humor is more broad than comedy. You know, when we think of humor, we often think of laughter, we think of jokes, but it is more broad than that. It's defined as a comic, absurd, or incongruous quality causing amusement. So that means it is comedy, but it is also maybe something a little bit silly or something a little bit different. 
So when we talk about humor in the workplace, we're not talking about making the workplace necessarily funny, but making it a little bit more fun. And so we can break that down into how we do that, like the different styles of humor. So psychologist Rod A. Martin defined four styles of humor. They are affiliative humor, which is like positive, inclusive humor, kind of like Ellen DeGeneres or like team building activities within an organization. There is self-enhancing humor, which is using humor as a way to kind of deal with any challenges in life. And there's a great Kurt Vonnegut quote that kind of sums it up that says that laughter and tears are both responses to frustration. I myself prefer to laugh because there's less cleaning up to do afterwards, right? So it's about looking at a situation and finding the humor in it as opposed to the difficulty in it. There's self-defeating humor, which is kind of a negative form of humor, but it's, it's the target is yourself. So this is like self-deprecating humor. This is where you're kind of poking fun at yourself. And this can be great when you're in a high status position or when used sparingly. And then there is aggressive humor. And this is a negative form of humor that has a target. This is like sarcasm and satire. And that can be really good for catharsis. It's just less effective in terms of creating change in the workplace. And so simply by starting to understand these different styles of humor, people can then be more proactive about like, oh, okay, if I'm if I'm leading a meeting, how can I create some affiliative humor? What are some things that I can do that is positive, inclusive, that brings people closer together? Or if, you know, if I have a stressful day kind of coming up, what are some things that I can intentionally do to then use humor as a way to, to relieve stress from the day? And so it's teaching people things like the, those concepts. So that, that's what I'd say is partly the, the science of it. Okay. How about the art yeah. side? The art side, I think, is is where everyone's going to have their own different perspective, right? So, you know, every audience and every person is, is different. So I, I personally love puns. And the way that I think and I see the world is something that may happen. And it's like, oh, I, I think of the puns of it, or I love the like etymology of words, or, you know, every every comedian has their own perspective, their sense of humor, their, their style, their persona. That's what is up for other people to develop. And we can help encourage that. But it's like, I can't tell you what's going to be funniest for the funniest thing for you to be able to say. But instead, I can try to draw out what you find in terms of what's interesting and how you go about, you know, achieving that. That's terrific. Now, what can leaders learn from a stand up comedian? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I think that uh, there's a lot that, uh, you know, leaders can learn in terms of overall using humor, but specifically from stand up comedians, there's a couple of things that, you know, I, I would encourage. And sometimes I work with senior leaders to work on them doing some stand up so they get practice at it. So for example, one of the things that we know as stand up comedians is you want to start strong. An audience will decide within the first really kind of 15 seconds, whether or not they think you're funny. And so just like any situation, if you're a leader and you're, you're presenting in front of a group for the first time, if you're, you know, just now promoted to a leadership position, or you're talking to some clients or that kind of thing, you want to kind of have that same idea of start strong. So stand up comedians will start and they'll say one of their funniest jokes within say the first 30 seconds, just to get people to laugh. And as leaders, we can do the same thing of, of starting strong and starting with what in the corporate world we call head nodding. Right. Starting with the things that everyone in the audience kind of already knows or agrees with. So rather than giving a solution right away, you kind of get everyone on the same page of like, okay, this is a context of what's happening. This is the, you know, we're all in agreement that there is a challenge here and that we need a solution for something before you jump into any type of influence that you're going to go for. So I think starting strong is one. I think giving credit. It's interesting to me because I don't understand the people who take credit for what their people do for them. The whole point of being a leader is to get good results from a team. And if you take credit, you are discrediting your own service of being able to get more out of people. So for example, at PNG, some of the the higher, more senior leaders, part of their rating is how an organization does after they've left that organization. Because at PNG, they don't want you to be, say, such a rock star leader and then leave, you know, an organization completely in shambles when you when you go to a different organization. They want to make sure that you're building the leaders within that group. And so similarly, you know, the cardinal sin, one of the cardinal sins of comedy is to steal material. So that kind of translation of like, here's an application of of how how leaders kind of parallel send up comedians. From a, a purely tactical standpoint, I think. Leaders can learn about brevity and succinctness. We in, in comedy know that, you know, brevity is a soul of wit. How do you get something down to the bare minimum in terms of the message that people need to, to know that they can resonate with rather than kind of being convoluted and, and sharing way too much information? 
Okay. Those are good tips. I like those. Now, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. You'll just apologize in advance. So let's take that example, a leader starting off with a strong joke. What's an yep. example of one? Well, it's going to be different for every single group <laughs> or for every different context, but a great joke is one that has some type of connection to the topic that you're going to speak on. So for example, in my TEDx talk, talking about the skill of humor, I open with a story about my grandmother and my grandmother texting and some of the challenges with that. And it's surprising. It gets people to pay attention because they're like, okay, why is this person talking about their grandmother? But the, the story that I build up to is my grandmother's lack of understanding of what the acronym WTF means and that she used it in a text with me and she thought that it means, wow, that's fun. <laughs> and so... I tell this entire joke, uh, kind of the story around that leading up to that punchline of her thinking it means, wow, that's fun. But then I use that to set the stage to say, oh, OK, well, I actually think the world would be a better place if more people thought WTF like my grandmother, if more people thought, wow, that's fun. And so that's now set up kind of the thesis for my presentation. And now I can kind of go into it. So, you know, we encourage that because sometimes people will hear, oh, you have to start with a joke. And so they'll say one joke, maybe one that they read on the Internet. It'll have nothing to do with their entire rest of the presentation. And the remaining 59 minutes and 30 seconds of that meeting will be boring. And that's not effective humor in the workplace. It's, you know, it's not humor isn't necessarily what you do, but more of how you do it. So you might start with a joke, but then you have that connection in some way to the topic matter. And then maybe you call back that joke a little bit later, or you consistently use humor in different ways throughout the presentation. Well, kudos to you, Drew, because you've taken this subject of humor, which is so important, and you've thought about it seriously. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, what's the impact? And so as you think about an organization, what is the impact of using humor? What's the benefit? There's certainly a number of benefits, and we'll start very simply with a simple question that I, I do want you to answer. It's maybe a dumb question, but in general, would you rather do something that is fun? or not fun. Yeah, of course, fun. Right, something fun. So that means that if you were to make a process a little bit more fun, if you were to make your own work a little bit more fun, you'd probably be a little bit more likely to to do that work a little bit longer. If you were to make say the experience of working with you or other people's work a little bit more fun, it's probably makes sense that they would probably be more engaged in their work. And that's what we see. There's over 30 business benefits of using humor in the workplace backed by research case studies, real world examples. So this is things like an, you see an increase in employee productivity. You see a decrease in stress. You can use humor as a way to effectively get people to pay attention or to remember things longer. Humor can burn calories. In fact, uh, 10 to 15 minutes of laughter burns as many calories as five minutes of aerobic exercise, 10 minutes of dancing, or 15 minutes of milking a cow. Uh, right? So you can burn some calories. <laughs> That's what individuals gain from it. As an organization, when you create a culture of positivity and a culture of using humor, you see an increase in employee engagement, a decrease in employee turnover, an increase in overall profit because of some of these other benefits. So there's tremendous business benefits to using humor at work. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, given the stakes here of how important humor is, and having fun and the increase of productivity and how it makes people feel. What's your perspective, Drew? Why don't people use more humor at work or individually? I mean, you see some people that are just downright dour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a great question. It was one that I wanted to understand as well. And so we ran a survey through our site and we found that the number one reason why people didn't use humor at work was because they didn't think that their boss or coworkers would approve. They felt like, you know, when you when you work in a culture where humor isn't the norm, you start to feel like it's unwelcome or that people wouldn't like it. But the reality is that 98% of CEOs prefer job candidates with a sense of humor and 81% of employees say a fun workplace would make them more productive. And so I think people are, are open to it. They want humor. They just don't think that they can, right? Because historically, we've always kind of felt like work has to feel like work. And maybe that made sense in the industrial revolution or in the industrial age when you work to set kind of, you know, nine to five, when you were doing where, you know, efficiency was the most important thing and where you actually could leave work, right? With if you worked in a factory, you, you don't bring your work home with you. You can't bring like, you know, some of the machinery home and get some extra like productivity in. 
But in today's world, we don't have that same kind of work-life balance. Instead, we have to deal with this work-life integration. We have to deal with the world where maybe we leave work a little bit late, but then you know also do some emailing at home. Or when we're all over the weekend, we're starting to think about our work as we go in. And so our emotions impact our ability to get work done even more so. And so I think it's partially just been we haven't adapted to that yet. Right. And so we just need to encourage people that there is benefit to using humor at work. Okay, so how can a leader make it okay to use humor? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of things. One, I think the best thing that a leader can do to encourage more humor in the workplace is to use it more themselves. You know, people tend to kind of replicate or they tend to follow what they see other people doing. And so if a leader uses humor, then they're much more likely to do it. And that's part of the encouragement that I had when first starting to use humor at PNG was, my manager used humor. My manager is willing to kind of to joke a little bit and have fun. And so it's like, oh, okay, that, that must mean that it's okay to, to do. I think the other thing that they can do, leaders can do more to encourage humor is, is to laugh more. You know, there is no kind of limit to laughter. There is no, like, if you laugh at a, you know, a somewhat not all that funny, but only kind of funny joke now, it's not like you're not going to be able to laugh a little bit later. So I think laughing a little bit more and certainly smiling more can help encourage people to use humor. And then I also think promoting it just kind of, you know, in the sense of if someone does something humorous, calling that out as a positive thing, you know, say, oh, so and so, I really appreciate how you use the story to start the presentation as a way to, to get us all on board, or I really like that you used images as a way to keep us more engaged. I think that level of promotion certainly helps. So give us some tips, for example, how to use humor to diffuse office conflict. This is a, a big one. And it's similar to kind of the story that you shared a little bit earlier is sometimes just any type of humor as a way to get people to take a break. I remember being in a meeting at PNG and we were, you know, coming to, to blows a little bit, like we were all getting our, our tensions were rising and, and all of that. And my manager kind of just stopped everyone and was like, listen, we need to remember that at the end of the day, we sell soap. Right. So we're working at PNG and it was just a context. And it, it was something that all made us a little bit laugh and kind of take stock of the situation in perspective. And that's not to say we didn't find what we were doing important or serious, but it was just that moment to say, hey, you know, this is something that we need to, to take a step back from and relax. And so I think sometimes just any type of that observational humor can help to diffuse conflict. Anything that kind of just gives you a different perspective into the situation that will make people laugh and remind us of our, our humanity. Because sometimes that's what we need to relieve that tension and diffuse that conflict is a reminder that typically at the end of the day, people aren't, you know, it's not like people secretly hate you or want you to do terribly. It's they're doing what they think is best or kind of what they know how. And so when we laugh, when we come closer together on the same side, we're like, you know, it gives us a, a chance to remind ourselves of that reality so that we can come back and say, okay, how do we approach this from a fresh perspective? Right. That's such a commonality, isn't it? To be able to laugh together. Yeah. And it shows when we laugh together, it shows that you're, sta- you know, you're standing on the same side. And maybe you're you know, in conflict, you're butting heads, but we take a break to laugh and you're like, oh, that's right. This, it's a human experience that we're going through. Here's how we, let's have a little bit of fun while we do it and recognize that you know, we're not out to get each other. Well, time goes so so fast, Drew. I'm always amazed at that. And this has been a fun discussion today. And so as we go into the final stretch here, do you have a favorite joke? <laughs> I have a, like? a lot of favorite jokes. So do you want one that I've written or one that someone else has written? Because I, I don't know if it's weird, but I do have my own favorite joke. Oh, whatever. Either one. <laughs> yeah, you, you take it from there. All right. So I'll say my my favorite joke. And this got pretty popular on the internet. So some listeners may have heard it, but I am the originator of it. The joke is kind of set in the context of my boss asking me, uh, how good are you at PowerPoint? I say, I excel at it. Uh, And he said, was that a Microsoft Office pun? And I was like, word. (laughs) Ah, good. Bravo. (laughs) That's a good one. I was at talking about this commonality, Trader Joe's, which is a supermarket, you know, a grocery Mm -hmm. store, like world class, amazing. I was checking out and the young lady said, uh, well, do you have any good jokes you've heard recently? And I said, well, yeah, sure. And I I said, you probably heard about the fellow that was uh, doing a survey and he was talking with this woman and he said, ma'am, I'd like to ask a multiple choice question. 
A is, you would like to live with your husband for the rest of your life. B, B. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she laughed and looked right back. I said, how about you? Have you heard of any good jokes recently? She said, well, yeah. You heard about the janitor that came out of the closet. I said, no. Supplies. (laughs) Oh, there you go. They're dumb. That's great. But they were fun. You know, we laughed and had a good time. Well, and that's a great example of someone taking a proactive approach to having fun in her job. There's there's no job requirement that says as a cashier, ask your your customers about a joke, but it was a fun way for her to engage with people coming through. And I think that is one of the, you know, big at least beliefs that we have is that humor is a choice, right? You choose every day how you're going to do your work. And so, you know, my thought is if you're going to work the, you know, the average person will work 90,000 hours in a lifetime. If you're going to work 90,000 hours, you might as well choose to enjoy as many of those 90,000 hours as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Now, any final tips you'd like to leave with our listeners today? Yeah, I think the biggest one is kind of along those lines. And and what we encourage is, is for people to think one smile per hour. Think about what is something that you can do each hour of your day that brings a smile to your face or the face of someone else. So if you know if you're getting ready to go into an hour long meeting, how can you, you know, start with a joke or incorporate a little bit of humor into that meeting? If you have an hour long commute that you're about to sit through, what can you do to make the commute a little bit more fun for yourself so that you relieve some stress and you're more present for your family when you get home? You know, what are these things? It it all starts with a habit. And I think once you start to develop that habit, you know, maybe it starts more broad as humor, like we talked about at the beginning, but then you learn kind of the, the more comedic side of things as you go through it. Well, great. And how can people find out about what you're doing, Drew? Yeah, if they want to learn more about humor in the workplace, if they go to humorthatworks.com, we have all types of different resources there from, you know, free blog posts and a free newsletter to, to more information about the book that just recently came out or some of our workshops. If they just like puns or they want to connect with me or follow me, I'm uh, Drew Tarvin, so D-R-E-W-T-A-R-V-I-N on all social media. So they can connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. I think I still have a MySpace page for some reason. So if MySpace is your jam, you can connect there. But yeah, that's where they can find me. Well, thank you, Andrew Tarvin. It's been fun having you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, we wish you all the best as you're making a difference in the world. And to all of our listeners, this is an amazing group, Drew, that's uh, listening in today. And they are truly making a difference in the world. And this gives them some more arrows in the quiver of ways that they can do that to lift and build and inspire others. I'm so impressed by them. So appreciate the contribution you've made. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited for, for people to be able to use it in any way that I can help them as they, they reach uh, those very cool goals. I'm, I'm happy to help. You bet. And as people are working on becoming their best, what we've been talking about today is right in the heart of these 12 principles, you know, of our vision and goals of being the best we can and incorporating these kind of things and, and to apply the power of knowledge. This is, this is just like, like Drew said, it's a science and it's an art. Well, as we master these 12 principles, they do help us to get to a whole nother level of making a difference. And that's why I'm so impressed with you, the listeners, because I know that's what we have in common. That's what you're trying to do. Well, it's been great to be together. This is Steve Schallenberger with Becoming Your Best Global Leadership, wishing you a great day. Thank you for listening. Would you like help to apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders in your life, in your family, or in your organization? Call us today at 888-690- 8764 to speak with a helpful representative to evaluate your situation and how we can help. Or you can visit becomingyourbest.com. Whether it's a corporate training event, keynote, workshop, trainer certification, or personal coaching, it would be our pleasure to serve your needs. Once again, call 888-690-8764 or visit becomingyourbest.com today.